Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be in the house of God with all of you today. Happy Mother's Day to all the, the mamas and the mamas-to-be and for those who would like to be mamas but, but haven't been able to. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. If it's one of your very first times here, just want to say welcome. So glad that you've come. My name's Dwayne. I'm the preaching pastor here, and I just, I'd just i love to meet you, and it's really our heart and desire for as many people as possible to come in and find their home here with God and with his people. Uh, we're jumping back into the gospel according to Luke this morning within the Bible, but before we get into that, I, I want to personally plug the, the men's retreat and the women's day that we have coming up. Relationships are extremely important. We believe that our God exists eternally in relationship with himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that he created us in that relational image, and that he invites us up into that relationship through his Son, Jesus, and that we then, because of that, really flourish and prosper as human beings when we're in relationship with other humans, when we have men's retreat and women's retreat and women's days and things like that. There's, there's special times, not only just to, to, to get away from all the hustle and bustle and all that and to focus on, on God and our souls, but there, there are also times where, where real quality relationships are, are formed and, and fostered. So I, I know there's some of you that maybe you've been coming for a while, you come faithfully and regularly on Sundays, but you haven't really got to know some other people very well. Man, if this is you, you, you just got to go. Just make sure you register today. I promise that you'll make friends and it'll be really, really good for your soul. For the men's retreat, we're camping this year, so that should be fun. It's close. It's not even like 45 minutes uh, away outside of town. And the place we're camping at, they have, a, they have a pool. They've got volleyball. There's places that you can hike in the mountains and, and, and whatnot. And, and we're all, it's only 50 bucks, so, so you can afford it. And, and we're going to have some special times learning together and how we can engage God, how we can engage our souls, how we can engage one another, and the mission that God has called us to. My friend uh, Kyle Bateson, pastor up in, in Reno, is going to be coming down and leading us. It's going to be a wonderful time. So make sure you go to Men's Retreat. Uh, likewise, the, the Women's Day is going to be a really special time of fellowship as well. It's at, it's at Moonlight Beach, which is it's actually the place that I grew up surfing since I was a little kid. So I, I'm trying I'm thinking maybe I'll try and sneak in there to, to Women's Day. Uh, it, it's going to be a wonderful time, girls. You can, you can hang out with other gals. There's places you can go shopping, lay out, get a tan, and just enjoy God's creation together. Uh, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll say about the, the Men's Retreat and, and the Women's Day. Spouses, make your spouse go. Like husbands, make your wife go. Wives, make your your husband go. You know, if you've if you got kids, you know, tell your spouse you've got it. Especially for the men, I know it's a lie, but you know, tell them you got the kids and everything will be be fine. And and for the women, it really will pay off in your man's life. He'll come back being a better better husband and a better dad. Uh, your spouse will come back refreshed and renewed in in the Lord. So make him go. And, and if you're single. Make sure you go, too, because then we'll, we'll brainstorm together who we can hook you up with. All right? Sound good? All right. That's commercial. Men's retreat, Women's Day, commercial, done. How'd I do? Sell it enough? You guys in? Good. Make sure you register. Let's get into Luke now. We are in Luke chapter 20, verses 25 through 21, in a sermon that I've titled today, Jesus, the Lord of the Poor. Would you... Stand with me for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 20, verse 45 through 21, 4. And in the hearing of all the people, he, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive a greater condemnation. Jesus looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus, the Lord of the poor. I preached my very first sermon in 1997, a little 
town in southern Oregon called Winston. It was a little church. There's maybe 40 or, or 50 people there. And that's when I first discovered that I had somewhat of a natural knack and gifting for preaching. I had no plans of becoming a preacher at that time. I my dad was a preacher, and so I knew somewhat of what that was involved in. And my family growing up, you know, in a preacher's family did not have uh, a lot of money. You know, I remember uh, as a young guy when all the, the other boys in my school, they were getting they were getting Air Jordans. My I wanted some, too, and my family couldn't afford them. And so instead, I, I didn't get Air Jordans, but I got British Knights. And if you don't know what British Knights are, they're, they're not cool at all. Not, not cool shoes. <laughs> so... I went away to to college, my freshman year of college in 1996, and I had big dreams, like most college students do, of, of being successful and, and one day doing much better than my family did and, and, and doing well fi- financially and making a lot of money. But after preaching that, that first sermon, I, be, I began entering into a season of seeking God and asking Him what He wanted me to do with my life instead of what, what I wanted to do, and I began to think that he wanted me to become a preacher. I had a, I had a hard time with that idea because I didn't want to be poor like, uh, like I was growing up, and and I didn't want to be a nobody. I, I wanted to be a somebody. I wanted to really accomplish something, and so then I went to a Billy Graham crusade, and I saw thousands and thousands of people who come to hear him. Him speak, and I started listening to other preachers and going to other large churches and seeing preachers preach, and they seem to be doing fairly well, successful, doing well financially, nice house, nice car, nice clothes, and well, make no mistake about it, there were good, genuine things going on in, in my heart, a love for God and for His Word and desire to tell other people about Jesus and see people come to Christ, the The dirty secret I don't think I've ever told anyone publicly is that a seed was planted that day in my heart, a seed where I desired glory. Fast forward a number of years of paying my dues, you know, leading small groups of people as a youth pastor, college pastor, preaching occasionally. I started to have larger and larger opportunities to speak at events and other churches. And, and I remember I got this opportunity to speak at a fairly large event one day, something like 3,000 plus people. And, and I remember getting down off the stage after preaching and to my horror discovered that I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked the light. I liked the, the crowd of people all sitting there listening to me. I, I liked the applause. I liked the glory. And I knew I was in trouble. So I began a, a quest from that, oh, I was trying to learn how to live for God's glory instead of my own. At times, it's, it's still a battle for me. You know, I, I'm preaching right now. Sermon. I want you to like my my sermon. I want y'all to like me. Sometimes it's a battle for me to to work and and to serve as a pastor here at our church and and be paid far below a, a, an average wage for someone with my education and work experience here in our city, and still just fighting to make it month to month. Sometimes I still battle these these things and. In the book, Glory Hunger, one of the preachers that I've admired and looked up to and, to be honest, wanted to be like at different times in my life, Matt Chandler, he, he says this, I find in my heart an insidious desire to be recognized and applauded. I work hard. I have some, some natural gifting, and I want people to notice this and say something to me and to others about how awesome I am. Notice that I used the word awesome there. If I had typed the word glorious, that would have caused us all to raise an eyebrow. In fact, as I read over the, that sentence and I replace the word awesome with the word glorious, I feel a sharp stab of conviction. 
glory is ultimately God's. And though I might reflect it, any glory I have is my creator's, not mine. In my saner moments, I'm well aware that I am fragile and God has not made me the hinge upon which his kingdom will swing. But sin is insane. I know what the Bible says about the proud. I am almost haunted by John 3.30, which says, He must increase, and I must decrease. And by Psalm 138.6, it says, Though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. This is what our passage today from Luke is really all about, our desire for glory. When really the reality is that we are simply spiritually poor widows in need. Last week we talked about how how Jesus is Lord of all and that that our real need is to admit that Jesus, that Jesus is is Lord. This week we're going to we're going to see that there's a sense in in which it's only the poor who will really ever utter those words. Jesus is Lord. So I kind of have two goals today. One is is both just to, to, to humble us, to to bring us down a level and to become and see ourselves as poor in need. And then second, really to see God's heart for the humble, for the poor. I've got three points today. Having nothing, needing something, and giving everything. And, and, and the theme really for today is just simply God cares. God cares. God cares about our pride and, and our desire for approval and praise. And God Cares for the poor, the brokenhearted, the needy, and those who call upon him. So let's jump into this first point today, having nothing. Our text starts out today with, with Jesus speaking up. There's a whole whole crowd of people around, but there's also a group of religious leaders who are, are there standing around, same setting and same conversation from uh, last week. The text is continuing, broke it up, says that they were the, the chief priests were there, the Sadducees were there, and then now we're, we're, we're hearing that the scribes were there too. They're basically all just different levels of employees of, of the church leadership of the day. They, they work at the temple, uh, they're, so they're supposed to work for God and for the people kind of use some some parallels. So just, we've got different leadership roles here at our church. We've got, you know, pastors, and we have deacons, and we've got community group leaders, and we've got other ministry leaders. The scribes here, their, their job for the church, their job is to make copies of the Bible. They made copies by hand. They studied the Bible. They taught others what the Bible would say, and then they were also the treasurers. And so they had the responsibility and the role of managing the financial affairs of, of the widows. What Jesus does is he, he speaks up and he, he directly addresses his disciples in a, in a teaching moment, but he does, it, he does it in front of everyone, in front of this whole crowd, in front of the group of religious leaders. I kind of wouldn't be surprised if he was actually pointing at them while he was talking about them, looking directly at them. And in front of everybody, as the scribes already says, hey, beware, beware of the scribes, beware of, beware of these guys. And then he just like rips them. Uh, he goes after him. What he says is pretty ballsy. He he makes fun of their clothes. He makes fun of their social networking, their eating habits, their financial responsibility, and he even makes fun of their prayers. I mean, the scribes they they dress differently than everyone else. So they they used to wear these big, bright, long, flowing robes, and then at the uh, bottom of their robes they had these fancy tassels attached, made by uh, Dolce and Gabbana. Um, they were they were super popular. I mean, everybody wanted to be friends with them. They had, you know, thousands of followers on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, they loved to go to galas and fancy parties. So, I mean, they would have definitely been at the Met Gala last week. That was $30,000 a ticket. Uh, had big bank accounts. They, they loved to pray these long, fancy, very robust prayers that helped make them seem like they were super spiritual. Oh, awesome God. How wonderful and great you are, omnipotent one. Love to pray like that to impress people. Jesus points out all these things and says, Beware! Beware! Don't, don't be like that. It will ruin you. And on the day when you stand before God, you are the judgment seat with God's throne, they will receive a sentence of condemnation. What we see in looking at these scribes is they seemingly had everything. 
everything you could ever want. The reality is, they had nothing. They were spiritually bankrupt and empty. Widows, widows were among the poorest of society, and widows back then, they weren't just someone who had, whose husband had died, but they also, their father was long past, and they didn't have any sons, so there was no man really to, to care for them, and so it made it very difficult, made it very difficult for them to generate any kind of income to care for themselves and their families, which is one of the reasons why the Bible in both the Old and New Testament, God instructs the church leaders to make sure to care for the widows. In our first part of our story today, from the outside, it, it looks like it's the widow who's poor. She's being devoured financially. But the picture that, that Jesus paints for us is it's those who seek glory, who want the approval of others and, and who abuse their, their place of power and influence, who they're the ones who are the true widows. They're the ones who are truly poor and destitute before God. And it's a real danger for us. Uh, Jesus' word here, it's this, it's a strong word. Beware. It's an imperative. It's a command. It's a rebuke that I think we need to hear today. One article I recently read in a prominent newspaper was titled, How the Human Need for Approval Drives Social Marketing Strategies. Larry Alton writes this. He says, people post pictures, write statuses, and share content that they believe will make them appear happier, wealthier, or insert any other word that applies. They wait for likes, comments, retweets, and shares. If the virtual adoration doesn't come, they are defeated. But if it does, they're on cloud nine. While this clearly isn't healthy, it's where we are as a society that craves attention and approval. Desire for approval is big, isn't it? We love it when people praise us and, and give us glory, even in the, the smallest of ways. Today, where and how have you had glory hunger? What is it that you've been seeking to, to get from other people that deep down you know you can only get from God? Approval can wreck us. Desire for approval. What also can wreck us is the abuse of power and influence, as Jesus points out to with these scribes. What's that? And that comes out in a lot of ways. I mean, that can be which when we've been we failed to be generous or charitable to others with what we have. It's I mean, when we have not fulfilled our duties and responsibilities properly. I mean Wasting time at, at work, not not doing your full hours, not doing your job. I mean, literally, you're just been scamming people out of the money that they are paying for you. Today, are there, there are ways that, you know, you haven't been honorable to God with your time and with what he's giving you? Or how about the flip side? Maybe, maybe you haven't been, you know, abusing your place of influence and, and authority and your job. But maybe you've been a victim. Maybe you've been a victim of someone abusing their place of authority. Just like the widows here they experienced. They were being devoured by these guys who were supposed to be church leaders. My wife was hanging out with a gal who started Soul Care House here in San Diego. It's a Christian counseling center, professional counseling center here. See, we love, we sent several uh, people in our church there that have needed a little bit more than what our pastors can provide. And 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 she said something interesting to my wife. She said that 65% of the cases that of people that come through their doors are people who have had bad church experiences, people who have experienced spiritual abuse from a pastor or another church leader. Just in the past two weeks of our church, I mean, we had a couple meetings, Pastor Buss one and me. Uh, I had one with another, with people in our church who were extremely hurt by the leaders of their previous church. It's painful. That's hard. It's hard to admit. It takes a lot of courage to admit that and then to still try to pursue God and then to be a part of his church. 
Well, I tell you today, if that's you, it's okay. It's going to be okay. I'm sorry that that's happened to you. Um, sometimes sheep bite. Church is full of sinners. And sometimes shepherds, the leaders, they use their staff in the wrong way. And I'm sorry. We really want our place to be a healing, more like a, a hospital. Typically, we tell people that that come in, they've had a bad church experience from their previous, hey, man, I know we're pressing all the time, like, get in community, you know, and, and start serving, like, but if that's you, that's not for you, you can just feel free just to sit and just to receive and just to heal for a while. It's going to be okay. Our God is a healer, and you're going to be okay. What we see in all of this is that Jesus cares. He sees the pride in us, and he has compassion toward us. And that's why he says, beware. He's reaching out. He also sees the brokenness in us. And did I see you? I see how you've been devoured. I see how you've been hurt. It's going to be okay. That's why I came to heal. God cares. He, he cares about us having nothing. He doesn't want us. He doesn't want you and I to end up spiritually empty and poor bankrupt. He doesn't want us to be condemned. He wants us to be cared for. Well, let's move on to our second point for today, needing something. And in this point, I want to take a, a little bit closer look at the widow in the next scene that Jesus honors for her financial gift to the church. First off, some things just haven't changed. Thousands of years, but back then in the outer court of the temple, the church of the day, where the people there's this place where people could could seek God and pray, and they had offering boxes there. I mean, we've got literally offering boxes here, four of them, different parts in the room. Uh, they did things a little bit differently back then, though, kind of interesting. Their boxes, they were made of metal, and so when people would put coins in, which was all the money that they used in that day, it would make this sound when the money would go in. And then one Bible commentator said that uh, for a period of time, the scribes, they would be standing next to the boxes, and then they would just announce whatever whatever coins were put into the offering box. I mean, can, can you imagine that? Like, we had pastors at, at the different, like, offering boxes, and every time you put money in there, they would just announce, $10 and $100, oh, $1,000. Can you, can you, that'd be really weird, right? Uh, we don't do that here for a couple of reasons. One, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says that whatever you give uh, at church, that that is something that you decide in your heart between you and God. Uh, so we we try really hard to keep that confidential. It's it's not something we're supposed to compare with one another about. Uh, and then 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it also says that those who compare themselves are among themselves are not wise. So we're not supposed to compare what one person gives with what another person gives. So don't don't do it. Don't ever say something like, hey, I gave this much. How much did you give? And if you ever hear anybody talking like that, they're like, I don't think this is a healthy conversation. You know, what a person gives is between them and God. Now, the widow in our text says that she she gave uh, two lepta, is the actual Greek word that's translated into our, our English as, as coins. Uh, a lepta was about 1 28th of a day's wages. Uh, so, you know, kind of today, the modern equivalent, it'd be about $2. She gave $2. Um, now, Jesus, he, he adds a little bit of his divine knowledge as God and says, that was her last $2. She gave all that she, she had. Just stop and think about that. To me, that didn't, does not seem very smart. Like, if she would have came to me as a pastor and was like, hey, I've got two dollars left, should I give this to the church? I'd be I, I would have said, no, no, please don't do that and let's see how we can give to you, how we can help you out. Uh, which is by the way, I just want you to know that's part of what the church's job is. It's one of the reasons why we encourage you to give regularly so we can do things like James 1 8, 27 says that religion that's pure and, and undefiled before God the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. So we've actually done this with women and divorced women in our church. We're proud to say that we have people who've adopted orphans, people that are in the process of that. So we take that seriously. But this woman, so she's a widow. She's because of, that, the, of the poorest of poor in society with no means or seemingly hope of, of how she's going to make it. 
but she gave the last two dollars to God at God's house. Why? Like, why would she do that? How could she do such a thing? I I baffled over this question this week. I just didn't make sense to me. This woman needed help desperately. She needed something from someone, somewhere. She needed help bad. Did not make sense to me. And then I had a a counseling meeting with a member in our church who's going through some tough stuff and we're just talking about life and some some hard things and you know just sometimes life's hard as a Christian. It's hard to find your your way forward with God and and so we're talking about a number of things and just seemingly out of the blue we weren't talking about the sermon, we weren't talking about money or anything like that. He said, Hey, you know what? I want you to know, Dwayne, that I believe that God is with me, you know. Uh, money has been really tight lately, and um, we didn't have enough to give at church, but my wife and I, we talked and felt like we should still give anyway, so we actually gave this last month out of our savings, and I literally interrupted him at that point. I said, oh, no, brother, you shouldn't have done that. And he said, hey, Dwayne, just, just hold on a second. Listen. Um, he said later that week, another couple in the church came up to them who didn't didn't know any of this and said, hey, we just we just want to pay for your rent this month. <laughs> we just want to take care of your rent this month. Just for whatever reason, felt by compelled by God to do so. Now, don't hear, hear me wrong. I'm I'm not saying today that you should give money to the church no matter what, even if you just drain your savings account to do that. That's probably not wise in most cases. I'm not recommending that. What I am saying, church, is this. God keeps the book. God keeps the book. He knows. He sees it, and he cares. I need to tell you something. I was so convicted in hearing that. Um, Jesus here says there's a difference in uh, between giving out of your abundance and then giving out of your poverty. Uh, this, real, this is real confession to you all. Um, I say this really to my shame. Last month we had to pay a bunch more money in taxes than i was planning on and budgeting for and expecting and i just didn't know what to do and how to make everything work out and so uh, you know what my wife and i talked about you know we did we did something that we have never done in the history of our marriage we've always just faithfully no matter what, given 10% of whatever we make back to God, to the church. But we just we decided to give a couple hundred dollars less than we normally do, just so everything would, would even out. And I didn't feel like I could stand up here today and talk about this passage without telling you that, because this has just been stabbing me in the gut, and then hearing the story of your generosity toward uh, one another, this couple in our church, it just put me to shame. And I got a couple things I want to say about that. One, I am so proud of this church. I am so proud of your generosity toward one another. When when I heard about that story, I'm just so happy of your faith in God and your love for one another in that way. So well done. Keep being like that. Keep doing that. Second thing I, I want to say about that is just mentioning the 90-day generosity challenge. Pastor Bus uh, explained it last week uh, where we're upping the ante for these next 90 days, for the next three months, and then the, what we're giving generously of our time and, and our talent and our treasure. And, and, I, and I've been challenged by that, by that especially, and I want you to be challenged with me. You know, think of how you could give more of your time to God, how you give more of your time to to God's people or for others of our mission in the city. Be generous with your time. Think about what, what what gifts, what talents, what things that you could do, could you do for God with, with a gospel intentionality to serve others. And then thinking about your treasure lastly, like think about, man, if, you, if you've never regularly gave to a church, think about like, hey, could you start? You know, maybe you can't do that. 10%, but you just give something, commit something small to do each month. Or maybe you've been, been doing that and doing that for a while, and maybe God's inviting you to, to step it up and start giving that 10%. And, and if you do do the 10%, it's a good guideline. Maybe think, maybe could we do a little more? 
you know, maybe God's inviting you into even greater generosity. Look, like we talked about last week, I'm not after your money. I'm not just after your money, church. Really after you seeing all of your life as under God and his lordship and his stewardship and plan. I like I really don't enjoy talking about money up here. It's actually kind of annoying that like Jesus keeps bringing it up over and over again in Luke, so I have to talk about it. You know, we're not one of these churches that are always just talking about money, trying to scam people out of the money. We just we haven't been devouring any widow's money or anything like that. We're we're literally still just trying to make it month to month as a church. Here's what matters and Here's what I think really sums up Jesus' teaching on money. It's a passage from the Bible in the Old Testament. I'm not today talking about money, but I think it applies. It's from 1 Samuel 16, 9. It says, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It gets what matters. What, where, our, where our heart is before God with our money. God looks at the heart. He cares about our heart. So it's not really so much about how much we give. It's about how big of a place God is going to have in, in our heart. God cares. He knows our needs. And he promises to take care of us no matter what. All right, let's move on to our last point for today, giving everything. The poor, the poor, they play a prominent place in the Bible, throughout the Bible. Old Testament gave specific legal instructions regarding the treatment, protection, and provision for the poor. The prophets in the Bible, they railed against the oppression and mistreatment of the poor at the hands of the greedy. Psalm 72, verse 12 and 13 says this about our God. He delivers the needy when he calls. The poor and him who has no help, he has pity on the weak, and he, and he saves the lives of the needy. Jesus comes on the scene in his most famous sermon. He kicks things off in the Sermon on the Mount, saying, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. His ministry was fraught consistently over and over again with the poor, with the needy, with the broken, those with ailments, the outcasts, the hurting, the abused. This is Jesus. This is who he is and what he does. He cares for the poor. He's actually the hardest on the rich and the proud. I got to tell you, church, seeing that in the Bible and seeing that in Jesus, this, this concerns me. It's been been bothering me actually a lot. Our city, San Diego, has the fourth highest rate of homeless people in the entire country. There's over 8,600 people on the streets in our city. I think it's fair to say homeless people are poor. I mean, beyond the homeless, depending on what study you're reading, San, San Diego has the seventh or eighth highest cost of living in the city. Does that make sense to you? San Diego ought not just be a place for the rich. Then on top of it, which was really bothersome, on top of that is the racial demographics. I mean, pretty much all the poorest parts of our town and our city are comprised of racial minorities. You think systemic racism isn't an issue in our city? You need to look no further than just that. That's another thing that really torques God, his love for all peoples. So this concerns me, church. I, if, if Jesus, the one whom, whom we call our, our Lord, if what we, we see him doing and what we hear him saying is that the poor matter to God and he cares for the poor, but instead we, we, we be, we're, just, we're just a you know, middle class, upper class, the predominantly white church, that's a problem to me. That's not okay. That's Ding, 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 red flag. I mean, we live in a majorly diverse city. Our church ought to reflect that, both racially and socioeconomically. It makes me really worried about whether or not we're following the real Jesus, right? He's the Lord of the poor. Jesus and his church ought to make a difference in our city. Look. If something happened in our church, it was just gone, shut down, doors closed, sign gone, no more service. Would our city even miss us? Are we even making an impact? Does our city care that we're here? That's a good question, God. Ask yourselves. You may not have picked up on it, but 
I've actually kind of been steadily saying stuff like this all throughout Luke, just trying to beat that steady drum because he just keeps bringing it up over and over again. That's actually what makes his gospel unique in comparison with Matthew, Mark, and, and John. Luke's just particularly focuses on Jesus being for everyone, for the outcast especially. I don't think it's a coincidence that we've begun to see some fruit from that. Um, we've been faithfully ministering to the homeless community in our city, feeding them once a week um, for probably about eight years now. But this year, something's happened, something that we've never seen before very much, ministering to our, our homeless friends, and that we not only see more and more coming to the dinner on Tuesday night, but seeing them showing up on Sundays for church experiencing the grace and the love of God and his word and his people. This is Aaron. He's standing next to Kevin Cheslukowski, who along with his wife, Laura, leads our mercy ministry. I, I met Aaron a number of months ago. He introduced himself to me as, as Ace. Um, started coming on Tuesday nights for a free meal. I remember talking to him you know, a couple of different times on Tuesday nights as I was wrapping up my day, getting to leave, and he'd be like, oh, I'm so high right now. And he's like, I just need to get sober. And I'm like, yeah, man, keep trying. That's a great goal. That'd be really good for you. He started showing up on, on Sunday mornings because he said the free coffee was a good fix for him as he was coming down after doing meth. Got hooked on meth a couple of years ago when he was actually trying to get off heroin that he'd been addicted to for over nine years, and then cocaine before that. Uh, when Ace used to first start coming on Sundays. Some of you might remember this. He, he, he brought this big, like, mean-looking dog. He would tie it up to the tree outside the gate. He had the dog because he sleeps down by the river across the street. And, and sometimes homeless people are actually trying to steal each other's stuff. They had it for protection. Most of the time that Ace would show up, he'd, he'd be high, and, you know, and we'd try to talk to him about getting sober, and he'd say things like, man, I just can't get off the drugs. I need him to numb my mind. One time he said, if I'm not high, I have to think about what I've done. And I can't think about what I've done. Everything I've done is so bad. You you, you wouldn't even be talking if you'd known the things that I've done. And 